Hello. Hello, church fam. I am glad to see you guys today. My name is Nick. Um, I am the one of the kids and youth pastors here at All People's Church. I get to work with the elementary school students, the middle school students. It's I think I have the funnest job on the planet, okay? So uh, it's a ton of fun. I realize that some of you guys actually uh, maybe don't know me because on Sundays I'm in kids ministry, hanging out with the kids and doing all kinds of... We like to say that Kidsman's the main stage, all right? So we're, we're doing the work of Jesus, discipling kids into their callings there. Um, so it's a ton of fun. Um, but since some of you guys maybe don't know me, my name's Nick, and I just want to show you guys my family really quick. This is me and my wife, Jordan, my adorable baby, Olivia. Okay, she's 18 months old. Uh, me and Olivia, one of our favorite things to do on the planet is to eat ramen, okay? So this is uh, me and Olivia enjoying some ramen, right? So uh, we, uh, we have a good time, and she is full of sugar and spice, okay? Um, just like her mama. Um, so uh, I get the privilege of talking to you guys today about a topic that is very, very important to me. Um, Robert laid out for us this uh, new series called Ancient Paths, talking about uh, the ways that have been laid out for us from the Lord and in Scripture of, of how to walk closer with Jesus, from people for centuries that have been walking with Him and growing closer to God in their relationship with Him. Some of you guys here today might not even know that you can walk with God like that. And so this summer, we want to dive into these different ways and practices of drawing closer to God in your relationship with Him. And today, I get to talk to you about one of the most transformational parts of that, which is the Word of God. Okay, in kids' ministry, we repeat things back. Can you say the Word of God? The word of God. <laughs> Let me hear it like you mean it. The Word of God. The word of God. <laughs> All right, I get to talk today about getting rocked by the Word of God. Okay, our vision is get rocked, get real, give it away. And I really believe that if you give God a chance, you will get rocked by the Word of God. My desire here for you today is that you get just a little bit of a taste of the wonder that God has for you in his word. He wants you to discover like a child the words that he has for you and the crazy, amazing adventure that he has for your life, the words that he has over you as a person and as a creation of his. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what the Bible has meant to me just in my transformation journey and some different ways that we can get rocked by the word. Are you guys in? All right, let's do it. Okay, so I just want to tell you a quick story. Um, for me, my, my story of getting rocked by the word starts in high school. Okay, I grew up in a Christian family uh, with incredible parents. They're sitting here today, my mom and dad, Ron and Cecilia. Woo, woo! Okay. Um, man, they have followed me all over the place. So <laughs> they're, uh, they're helping me out in all kinds of ways. But uh, they taught me all kinds of things about Jesus, about the Bible. We went to church on Sundays. I learned all kinds of things. But honestly, it didn't become personal for me where I really understood for myself what my own relationship with Jesus was until I got into high school. In my junior year of high school, okay, I, uh, I got my first car. It was a 1997 Nissan Quest in like lime green, okay? <laughs> okay, lime green. Not only was it lime green, it was my mom's minivan, all right? But it also had like shag rug seat covers, okay? <laughs> it was glorious, all right? And not only was it shag rug seat covers, but I was like a surfer kid. I grew up in San Diego, surfed my whole life. Okay, so I always like, after high school, throw my longboard in the wax side down on the shag carpet. So it's like shag carpet, seat covers covered in surf wax and like wet, musty smell. Jordan, I actually knew Jordan in high school. She has very distinct memories of that van, okay? It was a little rough, all right? But every day of my junior year of high school, I had gone through some kind of crazy stuff, a little bit walking away from God, getting distracted my priorities. In my junior year of high school, I started showing up to school about 15 minutes early with that minivan and those shag rug seats. And I'd park underneath, park underneath the same tree every day and for just 15 minutes, I would open up my Bible, this brown NIV study Bible that my parents had given me. And I'd open it up, and I'd start in the book of Matthew, and I'd just read one of those little sections. Okay, like, you know, the little bold sections in some people's Bibles that has, like, a little heading, and then sometimes there's a paragraph or uh, a whole, you know, half of a page, but it's just a short little section. And I would just read that little section. I didn't know what I was doing, okay? I'm a junior in high school. 
I just read that little section for 15 minutes. I might read it once or twice, and then I talk to Jesus a little bit and say, God, what do you want to say to me through this? And then whatever I felt like he was saying, I would go that day at school and try to do it and live it out and try to do the things that God was teaching me through the scripture. And then I'd show up the next day and I'd do it again. I'd read the next little section. And then I'd go try to do it. And then I'd show up the next day and I'd read the next little section. It's not like I was doing some crazy Bible scholar reading. I'm just showing up every day reading a little bit of the word and letting it be God's words for me and then going and trying to live it out. And what I can tell you about that junior of high school is it completely transformed everything about who I am. My entire identity was shifted. My understanding of the love that Jesus has for me, my understanding of the purpose and calling on my life, it shifted my priorities. I actually ended up stepping out of like what could have been potentially a successful career in the cross country and track and different things. I, I got out of those things and sports that I was pursuing because I knew I needed to be in ministry and helping serve with different people and living in God's word and doing these different things. Like it shifted everything about who I am. And I really believe that in the same way, if we give God's word just a few minutes of our time, hopefully more, but even just a few minutes, God will rock your world. Okay, how many guys went to a commission conference? Anybody? All right, it was an awesome, awesome time. Anyone show up for Francis Chan? All right, that was a good time. Good old Franny Chan, love that guy. Okay, Francis Chan, really, his, his, uh, some of his books really changed my life in high school also. That was around that same time, his book, Crazy Love. Okay, but he starts talking at commission conference about how he reads the Bible every month, okay? Just like reads through it. And we're all like, whoa, that's crazy, okay? But I wanna tell you, you don't have to just be a Francis Chan, okay? If you're like, I don't know if I can do that, that's okay. God's word still wants to rock you because guess what? I'm gonna one-up Francis Chan right now. You ready? (laughs) My daughter, 18 months old. She like barely speaks English, okay? (laughs) She reads the whole Bible every day. (laughs) It is a 38 page board book, okay? (laughs) But she reads the whole Bible every day, all right? That's, That's transformation, okay? And not only that, okay? But what I love about it is we sit in her little chair and we open up and she, and she says, bye, 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 bye. Okay, so we literally, I had it here and she's sitting with Jordan and she's like, da, da. And she grabs it, she's like, that's my book. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, but we open up this book and uh, we get to about here, okay? And there's the story of Mary and Joseph. And uh, we're, we're reading that story and as soon as it gets to this, the this page where there's the manger, She sees little baby Jesus in that manger and she starts saying, baby Jesus, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. And for like the next three pages, that's all she says, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. Okay, my 18 month old daughter who barely speaks English is getting rocked by the word, okay? (laughs) If she can do it, you can too, all right? So what, what I hope today is that from the youngest to the oldest, today we will settle in And let God speak to us and open our heart to the wonder that he wants to introduce us to in his word. So let me uh, pray for us. If you bow your heads, close your eyes. God, we just remove distractions. We remove the the things that are troubling our hearts, the places, the weights that we're carrying in today. We recognize that we are dry, like Robert said this morning. And we recognize that you are the living water. And we ask that as we open up your word today, and as we talk about your word and what your words for us mean, we ask that you'd speak to us and would you open our heart afresh. We need you, Jesus. We want you here. Would you come and be the living word for us? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today I am gonna walk you through a little bit, just three reasons we can get rocked by the word and three ways we can get rocked by the word. All right, three reasons and three ways. And this first one for me is actually really huge because um, with that junior year of high school, I uh, had this incredible transformational experience and was as learning all this stuff and getting grounded on Jesus and learning more about my identity. But in my senior year, I actually had a bunch of uh, a teacher and a number of other, I went to a public high school, Patrick Henry, um, had a teacher and a number of other 
people started attacking my faith, okay, and kind of challenging what I believed, all these things. I was experiencing this massive transformation. And then, of course, every time we move the kingdom forward, the devil comes knocking, trying to discourage us and pull us down. Okay, so the next year, all of a sudden, I get torn down. I had this teacher that made me read this uh, kind of opposing viewpoint to the Christian faith, and it rocked me, okay, because basically the thesis was like, all of this stuff is just a hoax, it's all propaganda. It's all a psychological trick. Like you only believe these things because someone told you to believe it. You don't actually believe it for any real reason. And it rocked my faith. It actually took away all the stuff. I mean, it didn't take it away. God puts treasure in our heart that no one can take away. Okay? But it pulled me away. And I actually like renounced my faith for a season, my senior year. Walked away from Jesus altogether. I kind of stayed in the places I was. But for about nine months, I was like, I don't believe any of this. Like, maybe this is just a hoax. It crushed me. It was the darkest year of my life, okay? And as I went through that, I won't tell you the whole story, but eventually God grabs a hold of me in a radical way in the back of my economy class and, and speaks to me and starts answering all these questions. But that drove me to this desire to see, like, it, what I learned in that process is that God is not scared of our questions. If he's the real Yahweh, the I am, the living God, of heaven and earth that created the universe. When we start asking like, what's the deal with this book? Not the board book, but the real Bible, okay? <laughs> what's the deal with this book? It's not like he's like, oh no, they've pulled behind the curtain. Oh my gosh, we gotta hide everything. No, he's like, I'm right here. Come find me, okay? God is not scared of our questions. He wants to answer those questions with the truth. Okay, Job asks a lot of questions and God answers him thundering from the heavens saying, I am God, trust me, right? The Bible has real answers for that question. Is it real? So my first, my first point of why we can get rocked by the Bible is the fact that it is real. That season of my life drove me to end up going to seminary later. And I spent five years studying the Bible, because I wanted to understand like everything I could about this book. I wanted to understand like, what is it? Where does it come from? How do we get it? How do we know it's reliable? What does it teach us? All that, like, I wanted to understand what was going on. And so for me, that calling was going to a place and trying to dig as much as I could into that. And what I learned in that process, okay, is that this book is set apart from every other text in all of humanity. The Bible is real, all right? I just wanna show you a couple things to show you guys that, all right? When, when you look at the Bible, what the Bible is, is it's obviously God's words for us. That's what we're talking about here today, but it's also an ancient text, okay? An ancient primary source, all right? And when you look at textual criticism as the process of like analyzing texts, how they've changed over time, what's added to them, these different things, okay? And when you put the Bible up against the text, the, the test that you put other texts against, there is literally nothing like it. Okay, one of the ways we test this is through something called manuscript copies, okay? And what that is is the amount of copies that we have of a ancient text, all right? And you'll see on this chart, the Bible compared to everything else is just like in a league of his own. The rest of these are like the most prolific and uh, most amount of copies we have of any other significant ancient text. The biggest one is the Iliad, which I studied in middle school. We did a play on it, okay? And no one even questions, like, oh, is, is the Iliad actually what, how it was written originally? Like, that no one questions that. But look where the Bible stacks up. Like, it's not even in the same league. It's not even in the same state, okay? Like, it's so different. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, this is the same, the same data, but in a different way. When you look at how different the Bible is from all the other texts around it, like it is so staggering. And the reason this matters is because the amount of copies you have denotes a couple things. It denotes A, how reliable, like if you have a lot of, of copies of a source, it means that then you can actually reliably compare it against others to make sure it's legit. It also means that in ancient times when they didn't have like Google and then AirPrint to go look something up on your phone and print it, like you had to painstakingly copy by hand every single letter of every single word of a 2000 page book. And to have this many copies, like that means that people in the ancient world as these things are happening are recognizing that it is so significant that like we have to write these things down. All right, let's go to the next slide. 
The other thing is that they won't just have a bunch of copies. We also have incredibly accurate copies. This is called the Great Scroll of Isaiah. It's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many of you guys have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls before? All right. So many of us have maybe heard of it. Maybe you haven't. Um, some of us have heard of it, but don't understand. Like, I know it's a big deal, but I understand why. I'm just going to give you two seconds of that. All right. The reason the Scroll of Isaiah is important in the Dead Sea Scrolls is we have copies of things. that We, we obviously don't have the original manuscripts because paper is really hard to <laughs> hold on to for thousands of years. All right. But we, as we look at the oldest copies that we have, one way you test a reliable source is by seeing, has it been edited over time? Have people like put an ancient Instagram filter on it, right? In today's age, you put a filter so that it changes it. In the ancient world, it was like, you changed it because you're like, I don't like how that makes me look, so I'm gonna change the words, or I'm gonna change this, or I'm gonna change that messy detail, okay? And in the ancient world, seeing something that stays the same over time is kind of unheard of. When we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1947, the... This scroll predated the oldest one we had of Isaiah by a thousand years. A thousand years. And you know what? As they, as they look through the whole thing, it is virtually identical to the next one that we have. Like that is unheard of in the ancient world, okay? The other thing is that when you look through um, the places that the Bible happened, you can see that it's historically accurate. Like over here, it's a little bit easy to be like, oh yeah, this is just a deep fake. You know, like it's just something weird. We're just talking about stuff. If you go to the places where the Bible happened, no one questions that the event happened. They might question like their theological belief about what they, what they believe based on those things, but no one questions these events happened. Because when you go to Israel, as, as part of my program, we spent time in Israel just going to these places and looking at these things. And you can't walk through Israel without bumping into the Bible. Like, it's just there, okay? Like, in Israel, there's actually a law where when you uh, excavate for construction, okay, you actually have to pause if you hit anything that looks archaeologically significant because there's so much stuff there. And then they have to bring in a team and spend the next two and a half years excavating it, okay? And then you can resume. Imagine for the light project, we had to go through that, okay? We think it's bad, all right? That's an You'd get two inches down, you're like, oh, we gotta stop. It's gonna be another three years before we can come back here, okay? That's how it works, because in Israel, everywhere you go, you just bump into evidence of the Bible actually happening the way it says it happened, all right? There's, there's this thing called the broad wall, Hezekiah's broad wall, 3,000 years ago, okay? The Bible records these accounts of Hezekiah as a king doing these things to save his nation from the Assyrians, all right? He builds these walls. It talks about where he put them. It talks about him building this tunnel to divert the channels. And a lot of times in the ancient world, people kind of like fudge the details. Oh, yeah, that's a, Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, let's keep going to the next slide. That's a great picture of me seeing the actual caves. I was so excited, all right? This is, uh, this is uh, the broad wall, all right? So... In the ancient world, when you would record down details, a lot of times you'd fudge the details. You'd say like, yeah, we totally put a wall there, but they actually didn't, okay? But when you look at the Bible, in an unprecedented way, you go to the places that it says things happened and you find the things that happened there. Okay, so it talks about Hezekiah's wall. They're digging down. There's like, in Israel, there's like a falafel shop over this, okay? It's not like, oh, we went off in the middle of nowhere. Like, this is in the middle of everything. And they find this giant wall exactly where Hezekiah said he would put it. And it's distinct because it's huge. And the ancient walls like that didn't exist at that time. Okay? So you find the things that it talks about. On the next slide, it talks about him building a tunnel, all right, and diverting the waters. And you go into the city of David and you find that tunnel. Okay? This is me and some buddies walking through it, okay, for like a mile. And the water's up to here at some points, okay? Um, but you see these things and then people will even say like, oh yeah, but okay, you see the evidence, but is that really the thing that like you're talking about? Are you sure that's actually Hezekiah's wall and Hezekiah's tunnel? Okay, they found, they get down into the tunnel and they find this inscription and literally it's 3,000 years old. They dated the whole thing and it says, by the way, this is the tunnel that Hezekiah dug. <laughs> Okay, like, what more evidence do you need? Like, you just walk through the Holy Land and you just bump into the Bible everywhere. Like, it happened the way it says it happened. Okay, and the next thing is that it's prophetically accurate. Go to the next slide. Did you know that Jesus fulfills over 300 prophecies, spoken some of them hundreds and hundreds of years before he ever lived, to the letter that they were supposed to happen? 
This chart is every prophecy that we know of. Probably when we get to heaven, Jesus will be like, oh yeah, you missed that one, and you missed that one, and you missed that one, okay? But this line is every prophecy that we know of, where it is in scripture, and then where it lines up with its New Testament fulfillment in exact proportion. Actually, this is a link that I, I don't know, I'll send it somehow, but this is a link that's an interactable graph where you can literally click on the line and see the, the prophecy in the Old Testament, the New Testament fulfillment, and what it means, all right? It's really powerful. Like, this stuff isn't hidden. It's just there. Like, the evidence is there, okay? God is real. His words are real, and they have real evidence to back them up. God is the real deal. And so if people actually start questioning or questioning your faith or questioning, like, are you sure this is really built on, like, ground? Like, you guys don't know your type. Like, no, it's there. It's physically there, right? So the next thing is, we, reason we get rocked by the word is that it is the living and active words of God. Living and active words of God. Um, can you go to the Hebrews 4.12 and then we'll go back to that slide. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Bible is alive and active. Sometimes, I think why we don't get rocked by the Bible is we treat it like a dead book. Sometimes I think we show up to the Bible like it's a math book or like an instruction manual for our car, which my dad has a lot of, <laughs> okay? We show up as if it's a dead text that's just a bunch of rules or instructions. If we show up like it's the living word of God and we show up to this book like, God, what do you want to speak to me through this? What would it change about how we receive it? What would it change about what we read in it? What would it change about what shows up in our hearts? Okay, we call this book the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. Okay, I intentionally put an S there. It's the living and active words of God. When we say Word of God, do we remember it's not just like a book with a title. It's the words of God for us, written for us. People ask like, how do you know that God loves you? Does he really speak to you? Which by the way, I think he can. But can he really speak to you? I'm like, he already wrote you a 2,000-page love letter. Like, he's already put it there. And th on top of the fact that he speaks to us now and today, okay? But he has a 2,000-page love letter set aside, not only for all people for all time, but he's for you specifically. Like, it's his words for you. What if we showed up to this text as if it was alive? In John 1, 14 and 18 is this beautiful description of, of Jesus, the Son of Man, who reveals the Father, okay? And it calls him the Word, the Logos. And Logos is this beautiful word that means like the, the essence, the entity, the, the fullness of, and the word, the utterance. Like it's, the, it's both the full essence of and the, the immediate utterance of the thing, Okay? And so it describes Jesus saying, the word, the Logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Next slide. No one has ever seen God. This is giving down a couple of verses. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the father has made him known. Do you realize that in this book, Okay, the words of God, the word of God is made to reveal to us the face of Jesus, the face of God. God wants to reveal yourself, himself to you in them. When we open the Bible, are we just reading like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Here's another rule I got to follow. Here's another thing I got to do. Here's another story, but whatever. Or do we read it saying, God, what do you want to reveal to me about your character? What do you want to reveal to me about who you are? Are you looking at this book like feeling for his face? I love, I remember seeing a movie where um, a, a young lady that was blind, she reaches up and she feels her father's face and she like runs her fingers over his face and feels the contours. What if we thought of the Bible like that? Running our fingers and our hearts and our eyes over the face of Jesus to see our father in heaven. The Bible is God's words for us to reveal who he is 
in the same way that before Olivia was even here in person, I was speaking to her saying, Olivia, I'm your daddy. I'm here. God wants to speak to you in the same way through his word. All right, and third thing is that the Bible is water for our soul. Water for our soul. I want to tell you a, a quick story about springs, okay? And I, I tend to nerd out about this a little bit, okay? But springs are really cool. And when I was in Israel, there's springs everywhere. And springs are all over the Bible. It talks about being living springs of water, okay? And when I was in Israel, God spoke for me for the first time in a, in a prophetic way. And he said, Nicholas, you are a spring. I'm like, what does that mean? So I started looking up, like, how springs work. Did you know how spring works? Where does that water come from? What it is, is a mountainside, okay? And rain falls on the mountainside, the water, and then it soaks into the soil. And as it soaks down deeper and deeper, eventually it hits bedrock, okay? And when it hits that bedrock, it flows along the bedrock. And wherever the bedrock meets the outside of the mountain, you get a spring, Think about what that means for the word of God for us. When we show up and let the word shower us like rain. In Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 3, it's my life verse. It says, my words are like rain. My instruction distills like the dew. If we let God's word rain on us and soak into our hearts, like not just read it and go on with our day, but let it soak into us, into the very soul of who we are, and get deep enough to where it hits the bedrock of our heart and then flow out of us, that would change how we get rocked by the word. What if we were to let the word of God soak into us like that? And the reality is, is that we need it, okay? We had this, um, don't put the picture up yet, but we had this bougainvillea bush that we were given as a gift. Um, this is a resurrection story, all right? It was so dead, all right? We tried to take care of it, but we just, we, like, we were like four days without watering it, Five days, four months, like, I don't know, okay? Eventually, it was so dead. It was like this dry stick that's like, have you ever seen a plant where you just like one tug, you just like the whole thing comes out? Okay, that was this bougainvillea bush, all right? We had no faith, but Olivia, she had faith, okay? Let me put up that picture really quick. This is Olivia in her super sick lion hat and her birthday pajamas. Oh, yeah, all right? She has this little water table and this little bucket, and she goes and fills up that bucket. And every day for like a month, she's just taking that bucket. She walks over to the dead bougainvillea bush and just pours in a little bucket. Okay, and guess what? After like two weeks, all of a sudden we're like, hallelujah, Jesus, we got a resurrection. The plant's coming back to life. Okay, this thing had nothing on it. And all of a sudden it's got green leafy. And I'm like, Olivia, what are you doing? But she gets it, right? When we're dry and dead, we need water. And Jesus says, I am the living water, okay? His words for us are like water that nourishes our soul. We need him to nourish our soul with his words, to speak over us. And if we show up to the Bible looking for that, not like this is another checklist on my tasks, but like I need God to nourish me with his words today, what would we receive from that? All right, so we're going to jump really quickly into three practices of like, how can we do that? What can we do? And I'm just going to give you like a bunch of different things that have helped me over the years. And some of you guys are coming in like, I've never done this before. And I want to encourage you to like, just give something a try. Some of you guys have been doing this for years, and I just want you to try something with a new perspective. All right, so we're just going to go through a, a bunch of different ideas, but there's, there's three things. Soak, study, and simplify. The first one is soak, what we were just talking about. How do you soak in the Word? The Bible says uh, that, that oh, I'm trying to remember the book. I'm going to quote it wrong, okay? But it says that Christ will purify his church with the washing of the word. The washing of the word, okay? One way you can soak in the Bible is to literally wash in it. Put it everywhere. Like, like when you're driving to work and you're in traffic, throw it on the audio Bible and just like let it run over you. Wash over you with it, okay? Put a little, I used to have a little index card that I taped to my steering wheel. Okay, and the Bible talks about people putting it in, in phylacteries, these things that go on your forehead, and you put a scripture literally on your forehead, or they would write it on their door frames. Okay, we have a chalkboard wall that we've written important verses that are stamped on our house so that we see them consistently. Okay, spend, I spent a season in SOT trying to catch up a little bit, and I had the audio Bible going. Okay, 
where I'm just like listening to the Bible consistently. And while I'm doing different tasks, I'm not even necessarily trying to like do some deep, crazy study, but I'm just letting it wash over me. Okay, that's one practice. Let it wash over you. Wash yourself in the word. Just shout, like whatever you can think of. Do something crazy. Okay, I love the students. Sometimes they walk in, they've got like things written all over them in marker. Anyone have kids that understands what I'm talking about? Okay, <laughs> like what are you doing? All right, and then there was one time a youth group where I'm like, bro, what are you? And then I look down and it's Bible verses. I'm like, come on, dude. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, wash yourself in the word, whatever that looks like. Maybe not in marker, I don't know. But okay, the next one is read it fast. Okay, Francis Chan kind of talked about this. How uh, reading the Bible quickly where you're just charging through it. You're not trying to like stop and understand every tiny little detail, but you're just like reading through a large section of scripture. Okay, maybe you've like never read the whole New Testament through. What if this summer you just like read through it? Like go for it, okay? Like just read through a bunch. Don't worry about stopping and getting everything. Like just read through it. And what Francis Chan talked about is how like you get the narrative of scripture, the story of what God's telling us. You get something different from it in that way. Okay, read it fast. Just like go through it and see what God speaks to you, the story. All right, read it fast. You can also read it slow. Read it slow. There was a year of my life where the only verse that, John, or that, uh, that God would let me read is this one in John 15, okay? And for a whole year, I would just read that verse over and over. That was what my whole FaceTime looked like, was I would lay on the couch, I would turn on worship music, and I would just read that verse and meditate on it. The word meditate, like in the Hebrew, recalls this idea of like chewing on something. Like, it, this is kind of gross, but you know how a cow like chews things four times? Have you guys ever heard that before? Okay. It's the same thing, like just chew on it. Read it slow, right? Take time where you, you just stew on one verse and let it soak deeply into your soul and become part of who you are, soaking into the soil of your soul. Read it slow. The other thing you do is make it fresh. Okay, this is actually super exciting for me. I, I feel like sometimes we just need, if we're kind of feeling that little bit of dry, we just need to change it up a little bit. Okay, one season I just started watching The Chosen instead of reading the Bible because it was the, the Bible in life, right? It changed it up. It, made, it brought the stories to life in a different way for me. If you haven't watched The Chosen, you should definitely go watch it, okay? Or recently, actually, having read and studied the Bible a bit, okay, not as much as some people, but a little bit, okay, there's ways where sometimes I'm like, oh, I've read this before, I've read this before. And sometimes just changing to a different translation like I picked up the message, which I actually haven't like read a ton of. And all of a sudden it was like hitting me in crazy ways. I'm like verses that I've read a thousand times. I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that was in there. Okay. Matthew 11. We've read this book that talks about Matthew 11 and it uses the message. And I'm just like, pff, 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 like God just speaking to me with this like new, fresh perspective. All right. So sometimes we just need to make it fresh, like change something about what we're reading or what we're reading it in or how we read the Passion Translation is a really beautiful one. Um, and then above all, just show up. Show up. Just show up and be in the Word. Let Him wash over you. Okay, sometimes we like get discouraged or we feel dry and so we stop reading it. I've been through those seasons, even recently. We put it aside, but if we just show up like that, that gentle rain on that mountainside and we just let it soak, even if we don't see that spring pouring yet, like if you just let it soak, I promise you it will change you. All right, one more, study, or two more. Study, this is obviously important to me because it's all the things I've been sharing, but actually study the Bible, like dig into it. See what you can find in there. Okay, one of the biggest tips I can give people that are walking in their faith, whether you're new or someone that's been in it for a long time, there's something called hermeneutics, okay? I wanna challenge you this week to go look up a video about hermeneutics. All, I know it's a crazy word, but don't worry about that. All it means is reading the Bible and understanding what it's supposed to mean, right? It's learning how to interpret the Bible. And if you just watch like a five minute YouTube video about like, hermeneutics and like, how do we read the Bible and learn some things about how to like think about what's the context of this? What is, what are the cultural things that might be going on? What are the books around it? What's the, is this a poem or is it a historical account? Like if you just start to do a little bit of like trying to understand what it is that you're reading, God will just open up the floodgates of just revelation on what he wants to speak to you. So study it. One thing you can do with that um, is a uh, 
one of the best tools is something called a, uh, a Bible companion. I have one here. This is called the Essential Bible Companion. It's by Zondervan. And all it is is this like one page about every book of the Bible. Okay, and it talks about like, hey, key words to pay attention to. Here's some historical stuff. Here's like things that you might not notice. Here's a theme. Here's some graphs. Here's a picture. And it just kind of gives you a little bit of info on like what it is you're reading and how to see more in it. All right, grab something like that. Or, or I use uh, Bible Gateway. Some of you guys have seen that on the internet. All right, did you know you could pay like less than $5 a month or like $50 for the whole year? And you can get access to like incredible commentaries of people that have been studying their whole lives and just like pouring out ideas about what these things mean. Like do a little bit of digging for yourself. And don't feel like you need to be like some scholar. Like that's not the point. The point is just to like dig a little bit to see what Jesus has for you in it. All right, and that's, that's my last one for this one is run down a rabbit trail. I love at youth group when uh, we are, are talking about something and we have like a point we want to get to. We're like, all right, here's the point, guys. And next thing I know, my sixth grade boys are like, but were the dinosaurs there? Like, were they? Okay, where's the evidence in the Bible? And all of a sudden we're on this like rabbit trail trying to like look for where the dinosaurs might have been. Is it the Leviathan that Job talks about? Is it this? You know, like all of a sudden we're on this rabbit trail. But those things, what they do is they open for our heart this like wonder of what God has for you. Like it opens your heart, run down a rabbit trail. Like if you see something that's interesting to you, like go look it up, go find out more. Like, why is this interesting to me? Like, let me chase this down. Let me find out a little bit more. Run down a rabbit trail and God will show you some incredible things. All right, and do it together with people. As studying the Bible can be so good, not just in church on Sundays, but like meet up with some friends on a Tuesday, we're grabbing coffee. I love Danon and, and Maverick. They're two of the young adult guys here at our church. You can't hang out with them without them, like, talking about some crazy scripture thing that they're in there. Like, I'm like, I'm just trying to get froyo, bro. Like, what's going on? <laughs> but I love it because they're, like, together in community. Like, we can dig into this together and get more out of it. The last main point of something we can do, okay, is to simplify. Simplify. Just read it and do it. Read it and do it. Just like my junior year of high school without any of this stuff attached. Just opening up a tiny little bit, reading it and trying to live it out. I hear people sometimes be like, oh, I don't know, I'm just not getting fed or I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor over here at this other church is not really preaching this. or that. Like we get so focused on receiving from the people. Sometimes what we need to do to get more from the word is to just read it and do it. Like go live it out. If you're like, I don't know if I can read the Great Commission again, it's probably because you're not like actually doing it. Because <laughs> if we're doing it, no matter how times we show up, I'm like, yeah, I'm still not making disciples the way that I think I could be. Read it and do it. And sometimes that can so change what God is speaking to us through because he sees us actually putting it into practice. All right, so here's my, my invitation for you guys. I have one challenge. And that's this. For the next seven days, whew, crazy. I don't care how long it is. It could be four minutes, okay? If you open up the Bible app, there's a verse of the day and it takes about four minutes to get through the thing that they have there. It could be a lot longer than that. It could be any one of these tools. It could be anything that we've talked about today. But if you just take a little bit of time each day this week and let the word wash over you, I promise you God is gonna move in your life this week. God is gonna reveal something about his character to you. God is going to come and be next to you in a way that maybe you didn't experience last week. If we just show up and we say, Jesus, I'll be here. And don't be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get four days. Don't be like, I'm going to, you know what? I forgot all that on Saturday. I'm going to read seven chapters and that counts as good. No, like just show up every day. Whatever you have in you, just show up with Jesus and see what his words have to say over you. All right, so why don't we stand up for a second? I'm just going to ask Jesus for a moment.